Hello. Hi, I am here again today with another STEM story. The story is called Mr. Ferris and His Wheel. And some of you may not know this, but the Ferris wheel was actually invented by a man named George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. He was born in Galesburg, Illinois in 1859 and he was a civil engineer, which is a STEM job. So I would like to read you Mr. Ferris and his wheel. It's written by Karen Gibbon Davis, and it's illustrated by Gilbert Ford. It was only about 10 months until the next World's Fair, but everyone was still talking about the star attraction of the last World's Fair. At 81 stories, Francis's Eiffel Tower was the world's tallest building. Its pointy iron and air tower soared so high that visitors to the top could see Paris in one breathtaking sweep. Completed in 1889, the Eiffel Tower stood at 986 feet surpassing American's Washington Monument to become the world's tallest man-made structure. Now it was America's turn to impress the world at the 1893 Chicago World Fair. But what could outshine the famous French Tower? And who would build it? A nationwide contest was announced. Before TV and internet, people from around the globe gathered at world fairs to share their different ways of life and their new technologies. Tasty inventions such as hamburgers and Cracker Jacks first appeared at world's fairs. Fair judges say no. Contest drawings poured in from around the country, but most of the plans look like the Eiffel Tower, only bigger. The fair judges said no to every last one. Was this really the best that American engineers could muster? To an ambitious young civil engineer, this contest was more than a dare. It was a matter of national pride. George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. had already designed some of the country's biggest bridges, tunnels, and roads. He could never allow a French tower to overshadow Americans' world fair. Why hadn't the United States built the world's first sky why hadn't the United States built the world's first skyscraper? George had seen the elegant steel frame rise 10 stories high with his own eyes. Supported by a metal frame instead of a solid wall, Chicago's home insurance building was the world's first skyscraper. Bird cages were the inspiration for the metal frame. George had an idea, an idea for a structure that would dazzle and move, not just stand still like the Eiffel Tower. Back at his drawing board in Pittsburgh, he and his engineering partner, William Gronow, measured and remeasured. A mistake of even an inch could bring their invention crashing down. George arrived in Chicago and made his case to the construction chief at the fair. The chief stared at George's drawings. No one had ever created a fair attraction that huge and complicated. The chief told George that his structure was so flimsy it would collapse. George had heard enough. He rolled up his drawings and said, you are an architect, sir. I am an engineer. George knew something the chief did not. His invention would be delicate looking and strong. It would be both stronger and lighter than the Eiffel Tower because it would be built with an amazing new metal, steel. George was a steel expert and his structure would be made of steel alloy. Alloy combines a super strong mix of hard metal with two or more chemical elements. The judges could not decide. 
fall turned to winter as they dilly-dallied. In only four months, the fair would open, and it still had no star attraction. Finally, and desperate, they agreed to give George's far-fetched idea a try, but they would not give him one penny for the materials to build it. The clock was ticking. George dashed from bank to bank asking for help, but when he began describing his inventions, his invention, lenders laughed him into the streets. So George used his own savings and convinced a few wealthy investors to join him. Still, short of money, he boldly went ahead and ordered the parts that needed from, dozen, from a dozen different steel mills. In January 1893, George's construction crew began to work on the foundation. Shovels broke as the workers tried digging into the frozen ground. It was one of the most brutally cold winters in Chicago's history. Blast, George ordered a few of his crew to dynamite the earthy ice, the icy earth. But what they found underneath was scarier still, quicksand. The deadly muck could st stuck man or machine in under a second. As the frost at the wheel side was three feet deep, the quicksand was 20 feet in depth and saturated with water, said Luther V. Rice, construction and operation manager. Pumps were kept running night and day and keeping the water out and live steam had to be used to thaw the sand and broken stone. George and his brave workers kept frantically digging. Finally, 35 feet down, they hit solid ground. They planted two huge steel towers deep into the earth, bolted them to crossbars of steel, and poured in cement to hold it all in place. Then they carefully lowered the 70-ton ax axle with fittings, the weight of a Mongol locomotive train. I'm sorry, at, 40, at 45 feet long, the axle and metal rod was still the largest piece of the steel ever forged, and a boy helped to hammer it into the shape of the Bethlehem Iron Works. Back to the story. The weight of the Mongol locomotive train between them, this sturdy structure would hold the gigantic invention steadily in even the strongest Chicago winds. At the time, as time grew shorter, freight trains from all over the country chugged onto the fairgrounds, loaded with more than 1,000 parts. Workers hurried to fit all the pieces together like a giant Lego toy. Hammers pounded nonstop in the breathless race to finish. Responsible for the wheel's many structural details, George's partner was losing hope. It's undignified. Stand back, dear, it might collapse. Bet you the wind will blow that Ferris folly into the lake. Nope, it'll fall first. It's going, it's going up way too fast. They say Ferris has wheels in his head. Frequently, I was discouraged and ready to give up. But though the encouragement of Mr. Ferris always reassured me and the work always resumed. Finally, with only two months left, the last section was bolted into place, and there stood a perfect, enormous circle, 834 feet in circumference, rising 265 feet above the ground, and designed to move with the precision of the smallest watch. It, took ex it looked exactly how George had first imagined it as a boy on his ranch in Nevada.
Living near the shore of Nevada's Carson River, George had often watched the water wheel turn around and around. Many times he had imagined shrinking to the size of one of his toy soldiers and hitching a ride up and away in one of the wooden buckets. Still, the biggest test was yet to come. The monster wheel had to spin and George's elegant passenger cars still had to be hung. The tireless crew worked day and night to attach them. Each was the size of a living room with enormous picture windows and 40 velvet seats. George's wheel worked like a bicycle wheel. Both are supported by skinny, flexible rods called spokes. As the wheel turns, the spokes work together to share the weight. These were called these are called tension wheels. On June 21st, 1893, opening day, I'm sorry, on June 21st, 1893, opening day finally arrived. 2,000 people gathered as flags waved. George took the stage and dedicated his will to the noble profession of engineering. Then George's wife presented him with a beautiful golden whistle. George and his wife stepped proudly into car number one, followed by their nervous but excited guest. Uninformed guards, uninformed guards closed and locked the doors. Would the wheel work? George blew the golden whistle. 2,000 tons of steel began to turn around as the soft clanking of a large chain drove the mighty machine. Up, 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 the car quietly floated above the mud and the noise. Two steam engines, an extra one just in case one broke, made the wheel turn. George had hidden them under the wooden platform where the riders boarded. As the car was lifted higher, everyone rose from the velvet seats and crowded to the windows. Spread out below them was a dizzying sweeping of the fairgrounds, the city of Chicago and sparkling Lake Michigan, and even glimpses of three faraway states. Below, more cars were loaded, and after the people had gone two times around and had 20 glorious airborne minutes in motion, powerful brakes brought the wheel to a whispering soft stop. When the conductor called all out, Everyone begged to go around again. The wheel is safe, the wheel is safe. The news raced through the fairgrounds, through the city of Chicago and across the country. All summer, visitors from around the world traveled to Chicago's World Fair. It didn't matter whether one was a senator, a farmer, a boy or a girl, everyone wanted to take a spin on the magnificent wheel. Adventurous couples asked to get married on it. On hot, steamy days, the wheel was per the perfect place to escape up, up, up into the cooling breezes. All you needed was 50 cents. During the 19 weeks the wheel was in operation, 1.5 million passengers rode on it. It revolved more than 10,000 times, withstood gale force winds and storms, and did not need one repair. At night, George's Ferris wheel became a magical glowing circle with 3,000 electric light bulbs, another brand new invention. As the queen of the midway made its safe, stately rotations, so did the seasons. Soon, a fall chill filled the air and the fair visitors began to thin out. In the late 1800s, homes were still lit with candles and kerosene lamps. The Chicago's World Fair helped reassure people that electricity was safe. At night, farmers and sailors from as far away as 40 miles could see the wheels, spectacular blaze of lights. On October 26, 1893, just before midnight, the immense twinkling spinning circle show, slowed to its final stop. The Chicago World Fair was over.
George had called his creation a monster wheel, but his investors renamed it after the inventor, the Ferris wheel. The Chicago Fair or the Windy City inspired two more magical places, the Emerald City in the classic book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by Frank L. Baum and Disneyland. Walt Disney's father was a construction worker at the fair. He told his son stories about the dreamlike city that he helped to build. And young Walt grew up to be a, to build a famous amusement park that stayed open all year round. Visitors returned to their homes to tell stories of the world's greatest ride, and before long, copies of the Ferris wheel began popping up all around the world. In 1894, the next Ferris wheel appeared in California on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Lit up at night, it was the first landmark seen by ships finding their way home. Today, Ferris wheels are the most familiar and beloved carnival ride at state fairs and amusement parks. A ride on one still feels like flying to the moon and ooh, the views. Since 1893, there have been several tallest ever Ferris wheels and the race continues with the proposal new, the proposed new record holder for the world's tallest, including the New York wheel. 630 feet and the Dubai Eye at 690 feet. That was Mr. Ferris and his wheel. I'm going to challenge you to see if you can build your own Ferris wheel out of anything that you have at home. I will try to build one myself and post it underneath this video later. Thanks. Have a great day.